When you see those cool images of astronauts floating around on the International Space Station, you might think they're enjoying the benefits of gravity disappearing in outer space. But there is gravity in space. It's the force holding the moon in its orbit around Earth, for one thing. But even if you knew that gravity is exerting some force on astronauts, you might not have realized that scientists orbiting Earth are actually free-falling through space. Hi, I'm Justin Dodd, and today we're breaking down misconceptions about physics, from how electrons move to whether or not Isaac Newton ever actually got bonked in the head by an apple like some kind of big old doofus genius. Let's get started. If there's gravity in space, how come astronauts fly around inside the International Space Station like it's a game of Pong? And is it still true that you can't eat sandwiches in space because the crumbs would float into the machinery? The amount of gravity keeping the universe together is actually pretty small. It's enough to harness massive celestial bodies in their orbits, but it's much less than what we recognize on our own planet. In the ISS, which is not so far from our planet, relatively speaking, the force of gravity is about 90% of what it is on Earth's surface. So, if you're looking to lose 10 or 20 pounds, boy, have I got a destination for you. It's right here, in my arms. You're perfect just the way you are. Astronauts on the ISS appear to float not because there's less gravity, it's actually because they're free-falling, meaning that their motion is caused only by gravity and no other force. As Galileo figured out, more on him later, in the vacuum of space, all objects fall at the same rate of acceleration regardless of their mass. But the ISS doesn't come crashing to the ground because, while it's falling towards Earth, it's moving horizontally nearly five miles every second. The Earth is curving away from the orbiting space station, meaning it can't hit the ground. And since both the ISS and the people in it are falling at the same speed, they float. Even crumbs from a hypothetical sandwich would be falling at the same rate as a computer weighing hundreds of pounds, and each would appear weightless. Special shout out to YouTube commenter Mark McCombs for mentioning that fact about the ISS on our Misconceptions video about dogs. We've got an upcoming episode discussing misconceptions about prison. If you know any interesting myths about that topic, you know what to do. Isaac Newton discovered gravity when an apple fell on his head. You know the famous tale. The physicist Isaac Newton was sitting under a tree, minding his own business, when an apple fell on top of his head. Newton immediately realized there must be some cosmic force that makes an apple fall straight down to the earth, and possibly a more metaphysical entity that had damned him to a life of fruit misfortune. Right then and there, he devised the theory of gravity. However, like George Washington chopping down a cherry tree and being unable to lie about it, Newton's story is something of a myth. So what really happened? After his university closed in 1665 due to a plague outbreak, Newton returned to his rural hometown of Woolsthorpe, England. Moving home after a deadly pandemic, who could relate? After a long day of doing math problems, he liked to stretch out under the family's apple tree. According to his biographer William Stukeley, that is where the eureka moment occurred, but it did not involve getting bonked on the head. Newton himself told Stukeley what had gone down when they had dinner together on April 15th, 1726. Newton was then the world's leading physicist and the president of the Royal Society. After the meal, Stukeley wrote in his notes, the weather being warm, we went into the garden and drank tea under the shade of some apple trees. He told me he was just in the same situation as when formerly the notion of gravitation came into his mind. It was occasioned by the fall of an apple as he sat in a contemplative mood. Newton had wondered to himself why the apple would always fall perpendicularly to the ground and not drift sideways or upward or float on the breeze. He thought there must be an invisible force or forces that not only put the apple in motion, but also governed its trajectory and speed. The apple tree episode was just the start of his experiments and calculations towards solving this puzzle. In the following two decades, he worked on the problem while also serving as a professor of mathematics at Trinity College, Cambridge. In that time, he improved the reflecting telescope, which concentrates light to allow greater visibility of faraway objects, and then presented his research in optics to the Royal Society. He also sent a preliminary paper on motion to the astronomer Edmund Halley, of the comet fame, who had proposed that comets do not travel in straight lines, but in elliptical orbits around a focal point. I would have told Newton to stop making everyone else look lazy, but Halley encouraged Newton to consolidate his theories of force and motion into a book. The result, titled The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, broke science when it was published in 1687. 
Newton laid out his three laws of motion, which describe inertia, momentum, and actions and reactions, as well as his theory of universal gravitation. Newton posited that inertia would make the moon fly out of its orbit around Earth in a straight line unless Earth exerted a force on it, keeping it in its elliptical path. Long story short, Newton concluded that Earth's force on the moon is the same force that pulls apples off a tree, which we now know as gravity. But the whole bonking thing it's probably just a modern addition to make kids giggle in science class. Electrons orbit an atom's nucleus like planets around the sun. You probably remember a diagram from your high school physics or chemistry class. It shows electrons traveling around the nucleus of an atom, kind of like a planet travels around the sun. The little ellipses make it look like a train track that the electron rides. But that's not really an accurate representation of how electrons move. There might not even be a way to accurately represent how electrons move. In 1913, the Danish physicist Niels Bohr published his model of an atom structure. It had positively charged protons and non-charged neutrons held together in the atom's nucleus, plus negatively charged electrons circling the nucleus in concentric orbits, called shells. When an electron hopped from an interior lower energy shell to an outer higher energy shell, it absorbed a finite amount of energy. When the move was reversed, the electron gave off a specific amount of energy. This is the model you probably remember from high school. It's also called the planetary model because it mimics the movements of planets around the sun. The problem is, the developers of quantum physics eventually realize that electrons don't exist in this straightforward way. Remember, when you get to a small enough scale, things start to behave a lot differently than the way we're used to thinking about objects in the human-sized physical world. Electrons are quantum objects, meaning they have a dual nature and can act like either a particle or a wave. They're not solid, discrete objects. Instead of moving in neat circles, electrons linger around the nucleus as waves called orbitals that vibrate at different frequencies. They don't have defined trajectories or positions at all. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle tells us that we can't simultaneously define their position and speed. I mean, just forget trying to make a date for coffee with an electron. I'm speaking from personal experience. Rather than putting an electron at a specific place in a diagram like a city on a map, it's more accurate to think of a range of probabilities where an electron could theoretically be. To make matters even more complicated, believe it or not, there's an exception to this indeterminate behavior. These probabilistic cloud-like orbitals can glom together into things called wave packets. And according to a study from 2004, the packets can orbit the nucleus in a way that is actually not dissimilar to the high school textbook diagram. Now at this point, we're getting into physics that are honestly way above my pay grade. Let's just leave it at this. If your conception of individual electrons has them zooming around in a nice little ellipse, you should know that's not quite right. The actual representation, God, my brain hurts, just trust me on this one, okay? Galileo dropped objects from the Leaning Tower of Pisa to prove a theory. It's like a scene out of a movie, a movie about experimental physics, which are disappointingly lacking in modern Hollywood. Galileo climbs to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and drops two spheres of different weights to test the belief the heavier one will hit the ground first. Shockingly, the spheres land at the same time. The reason? The heavier ball has a greater mass, and because of that, gravity acts on it more forcefully. But thanks to inertia, the heavier ball needs more force to get it to accelerate. And weirdly, those two effects cancel each other out. Therefore, two objects of different masses will fall at the same speed in a vacuum. But thankfully for us, and annoyingly for physics, we do not live in a vacuum, so we need to look at a third force, air resistance. Let's say Galileo drops a big piece of plywood and a brick out the window. Rude, but you know, I guess in the name of science, whatever. The plywood has more mass and therefore more gravitational force than the brick, but as both fall, the wood's shape experiences more air resistance, so the brick should hit the ground first. But getting back to the spheres, Galileo heaving them off the tower probably didn't happen. The legend can be traced to a biography of the scientist written by his secretary and disciple Vincenzo Viviani, who uh, embellished a few things. In addition to the tower story, Viviani attributes Galileo's discoveries of the principles of pendulum motion to his observation of a swinging lamp in Pisa Cathedral, which also likely did not happen. Those poetic origin stories proved popular. The 
fanciful details were repeated by Galileo's followers. These falling body experiments didn't end with Galileo, though. They became popular public scientific displays where non-scientists could see marvelous demonstrations of physical laws, none more memorable than astronaut David Scott reenacting Galileo's theory on the moon. During the Apollo 15 mission in 1971, Scott set himself up in front of a TV camera on the lunar terrain. He held a hammer in his right hand and a falcon feather in his left. As the camera zoomed out, Scott dropped both objects and both fell to the moon's surface at the same time in the near vacuum of space, despite their different masses and shapes. The moon is no leaning tower of Pisa, but you know, it'll do. Erwin Schrodinger was not a cat person. In classical physics, predating Schrodinger and his contemporaries, particles and waves were thought of as two distinct categories of atomic existence. Particles could be identified in space and time. They had qualities like mass and volume. No two particles could be in the same place at the same time. Waves, on the other hand, could be spread out in space, like sound waves being heard by different people in different places. The physics that replaced this classical model recognized that reality is much more complex. In a nutshell, quantum mechanics analyzes how matter behaves on the atomic and even subatomic levels. It describes the actions and qualities of atoms and subatomic particles, such as protons, neutrons, and electrons, as they interact with things like electromagnetic radiation. This model holds that any particle can behave as a wave and vice versa. Schrodinger's equation recognized this duality of atomic bits of matter, and in an important breakthrough, it demonstrated the quantum behavior of wave functions. That means, in order to describe waves, the most accurate mathematical model can only show the probability of certain events happening, not the kind of fixed information we're used to analyzing in the larger physical world. If a quantum system is not observed or measured, Schrodinger claimed, then it does not have definable properties. You may not be surprised to hear that discoveries about atomic behavior following Schrodinger's equation struck scientists as kind of illogical. The theories might be correct on the atomic level, but in the normal world, they make no sense. Even Schrodinger himself was annoyed by this paradox. In 1935, he proposed the hypothetical situation to illustrate its absurdity. A cat is locked in a steel box with a tiny bit of radioactive substance. Over the course of an hour, if the substance decays, it will trigger the release of a poison that will kill the cat. If the substance does not decay, the cat will live. Both scenarios are equally probable, but Schrodinger wrote, one will not know if the cat is alive or dead without opening the box and looking inside, thereby observing the whole system and defining its properties as either living or dead. Until the box is opened, the cat is both. The hypothetical experiment showed how the laws of quantum physics don't always line up with reality, and physicists still debate the nature of the quantum world compared to the world experienced at the scale we are all familiar with. Schrodinger was not advocating that anyone actually try this experiment, and fortunately, nobody has. But why a cat? His reasons for choosing a cat for this exercise and not a dog or hamster are unclear. But he did grow up with an aunt who owned as many as 20 Angora cats, so there's that. Einstein built the atomic bomb. 1905 was a banner year for Albert Einstein. The German theoretical physicist had earned his doctorate and published four major papers in a German research journal. Though each one described a revolutionary new approach to understanding aspects of the universe, the final paper demonstrated the equivalence of mass and energy and summed up the complex theory in the iconic equation E equals mc squared. Unfortunately, Einstein's discovery had an unintended effect. It spurred European research into using the equivalence of energy and mass to develop atomic weapons. In 1939, German chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann with Austrian physicist Lisa Meitner announced they had achieved nuclear fission. Soon after, Einstein was contacted by the Hungarian physicists Leo Szilard, Eugene Wigner, and Edward Teller. Szilard expressed their concern that German forces could potentially seize Belgium's supply of uranium, which it mined in its African colonies, for atomic weapons. Knowing that Einstein was friendly with the Belgian queen, Szilard wanted him to sign off on a letter asking Belgium to stop selling uranium to Germany and give it to the United States. Einstein suggested sending it to a cabinet minister instead, and that was that. It was quickly realized that a letter should be sent to Roosevelt about the threat, which Einstein also signed. An envoy hand-delivered the letter to President Franklin Roosevelt and even read it out loud to make sure the commander-in-chief understood the precipice on which humanity stood. The signature of Einstein, the world's most famous scientist, undoubtedly helped convey the importance of the matter. 
Roosevelt approved the research and the funding to launch what was essentially the predecessor of the Manhattan Project. Years later, Los Alamos National Laboratory director J. Robert Oppenheimer led a team of scientists, including physicist Enrica Fermi and nuclear chemist Glenn Seaborg, with oversight from the U.S. Army. Einstein never worked on the Manhattan Project and was denied a security clearance because of his pacifist stance. The project eventually developed and tested the world's first nuclear weapons. The only two atomic bombs ever deployed in warfare landed on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan in 1945. By then, Szilard was writing petitions against using America's nuclear weapons. Ironically, the Axis powers never got close to mastering the technology for their own nuclear weapons. Einstein regretted his role, however small or large, in promoting nuclear development. As he said, Had I known that the Germans would not succeed in developing an atomic bomb, I would have done nothing for the bomb. Thanks for watching Misconceptions. Physics is a bit confusing for my worm brain, but at least it's something I can blame whenever I drop my phone and crack the screen for the 11th time. I'll see you next time. Damn it, physics!